Well, good morning, everybody. It's such an honor to be opening the second day of this great conference. I thought the talks yesterday were just fantastic. My name is Franziska Hinkelmann, and I want to talk to you about JavaScript engines. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I'm an engineer at Google. I work on the V8 team. V8 is Google's open source JavaScript engine that's used in Chrome and Node.js and other embedding applications. And I'm also a member of the Node.js CTC. That's the core technical committee. So I'm a contributor, and I'm involved in the techni technical decisions about the Node.js project. I'm from Germany, and I work in the Munich office. So it's quite a long flight, but it's definitely not the, the longest flight of the people here. Um, our office in Munich, it's a fairly reasonable sized engineering office. There are 500 engineers. Some of them work on Chrome, and there's also internal tooling that we do there. And most of the V8 team, like almost all the V8 team, we're around 30 people, is located in Munich. So if you ever wondered if you have to move to Mountain View to work on cool Google projects, there's some excellent engineering going on in Germany. So the next 45 minutes, I want to give you, as much as I can, an overview or an introduction to JavaScript engines, um, specifically with the focus of what they do to great, create good performance for JavaScript. Why, why would you care about JavaScript engines? So any JavaScript code that you run, it doesn't matter whether it's in a browser or IoT or Node.js or a command line tool, any JavaScript code to go from source code to executing the machine code, that is done by the, by the JavaScript engine. So basically, it's the foundation of any JavaScript work that you do, no matter what. And I think it's important that you don't only understand how to use JavaScript, but also what it does under the hood, because that will explain to you a little bit of why you do certain things in a certain way. Um, I really like to understand how things are working and not only be taught how to use it. So I want to share that about JavaScript engines so that it's less of a black box magic for you about what's happening when you load your source code in the browser to when it's being executed. Um, it's what you learn in this talk, you probably will not go into the office on Monday and say, oh, I heard a talk and I'm going to apply this right now. It's not a library or a tool that you can easily add to your project, but I hope that it gives you a better overall understanding of how JavaScript engines, how they work, and how they are influenced by the code that you write. So by knowing that almost in like an intuitive way, you might be able to write JavaScript code that works better for the modern engine. So in the end, you have better performance. Or maybe at some point in your career, not, ne not necessarily next week on Monday, but maybe two years down the road, you have to track a nasty performance issue. And having this kind of understanding might, might help you there getting a little bit more insight and then being able to fix that performance issue when it arises. Um, I want to compare this maybe to, to sports. So I'm really into horseback riding. And you can learn horseback riding by taking lessons. And the instructor tells you, if you do this, the horse will do this. And you practice that. And they tell you what to do so you learn how to ride. But if you actually study a little bit the anat anatomy of the horse, um, so that'll give you a better understanding of why you're doing certain things. And, and you're not, like if you learn the anatomy, you're not learning a new lesson that you can apply right the next day and make your horse go sideways. You're just gaining like a, a, a deeper understanding that later on will help you. So I don't have to tell you that JavaScript is literally everywhere. It's on every operating system. It's on the web. It's on mobile. It's uh, server side. It's on IoT devices. It's everywhere because it's a solution for a lot of problems. Um, it works really well if you're just hacking something out and prototyping. It works really well for beginners or for kids because you have this instant feedback you can make with kids 
a website with JavaScript in an afternoon and they can show it off to your parents. Like, that is really awesome, but it's also great for enterprise projects. I mean, I think most of you probably have production critical things written in JavaScript. Um, we have React frameworks, Angular frameworks, we have enterprise node servers, and all of that is powered by JavaScript. And I, I think one of the reasons that allowed JavaScript to be everywhere is its performance. Um, I want to give you this quote here. A 100x improvement in JavaScript performance since 2001. So 100 times faster than it was at some point. Um, the, the statistic where I got this from is already a few years old, so it's even faster now. But just imagine your JavaScript was still as slow as it was in 2001. You could never write a Facebook post, probably. Like, it would just take way too long. Like, all the tools that we have, they would be useless if JavaScript weren't as fast as it is. And without the tools, we wouldn't have the community, we wouldn't have the libraries. Like, it all goes together. And it is, in, in big parts, driven or enabled by the fast JavaScript that the browsers are giving us. And the performance of JavaScript, what it comes down to is what the JavaScript engine does. Because the engine is executing your JavaScript, so if the engine is slow, you'll have a really bad experience using a JavaScript application. Um, so, JavaScript engines are what give us performance, and they have massively improved performance over the last 10, 15 years. And I want to show you some of the details what the engines are doing to get this speed up, and why we are not stuck in, in slow JavaScript from 2001. There's more than one engine, luckily. I say luckily because having several engines means competition, and competition means that we keep working on improving the engine. So in the end, everybody benefits because it gets faster, it uses less memory, all those things. Um, just a very quick overview. So all the major browsers have their own engine. There is Chakra Core in Microsoft Edge, JavaScript Core or JSC in WebKit Safari, and Firefox Engine is called Spider Monkey, and then Chrome has V8. And you know, um, JavaScript's not limited to the web. Node.js obviously has a JavaScript engine. By default, that's V8, but you can also get the node with Chakra Core, and there's a Spider Node fork. Um, Electron has a JavaScript engine, and on Internet of Things, on IoT devices, Sometimes you're forced to trade in performance for memory size. So um, on, on some IoT devices, if they're too small, you don't want to run a full-blown, super-fast browser JavaScript engine. You use um, an, an interpreter one that is much smaller in memory size, but maybe a little slower. So there's um, Samsung, there's duct tape and Samsung's JerryScript, for example. And since I work on V8, most of the details will be about V8, but the general concepts are the same in, in the modern engines. So things have different names, and the bytecode looks slightly different in the other engines, but overall, it's a, it's a very similar concept. So any compiler, doesn't matter what language, is usually built up like this. You have source code, and then the first step is that you pass that source code with a Lexan tokenizer into an AST. That's an abstract syntax tree. That's just a representation of your source code that is more approachable for machines to work on it. So that is just a different representation of what you wrote, which makes it easy for the compiler or interpreter then to work on that representation. So once you have an AST, then there's the part that generates the machine code. Um, sometimes that's called a compiler, sometimes it's called an interpreter. Um, there isn't really much of a difference, it's more of a preference. Um, in general, a compiler is anything that takes one kind of format and turns it into another kind of format. Um, so you can compile JavaScript in general, when you have JavaScript, you compile it to machine code, or uh, on a more specific level, you have the abstract syntax tree that you compile to machine code, and sometimes we also call this interpreter um, if it's not an explicit compile step. So that's what sort of every compiler looks like. 
And actually, I will not cover the first part here, so I will not talk about the parser, but my coworker Maya, she has an excellent talk on YouTube that goes into all the details of the quirks that you have to worry about when you parse JavaScript. So I recommend watching this, this talk and getting some idea about what the parser is doing. Um, I will focus on the, the second half of this part. I will focus on the interpreter compiler part here and the machine code that is generated. So I keep referring to this over and over during the talk, so this is important. Um, the compiler that JavaScript engines use is a just-in-time compiler. That's abbreviated as JIT a lot of times. You can JIT code, that means you're just-in-time compiling it. Um, a just-in-time compiler, sometimes it's also called a lazy compiler, that means you compile the code just in time as you run it. The, the opposite to that is an AOT compiler, a head of time compiler. That is when you first compile all the code, and once you're done compiling, you have a separate step that runs the code. In a just-in-time compiler, that is different, and that's the important part now. In just-in-time compilers, you alternate between compile time and runtime. So, you have code, you compile a little bit, and you run that, and then you compile some more, and you run that, and you always flip between compiling and running. And the big advantage here is, um, it's not that you're lazy, so you save a lot. The, the bigger advantage is that when you run code, you can gather runtime information. Things like which, which functions are run, what kind of parameters are they called with, and you only get this information as you're running the code. So only during runtime can you collect this information, and just-in-time compilers actually use this information to then create better compilation targets. So you, you start off, the compiler doesn't know anything, and it's compiling in sort of a dumb way. Once it has compiled a little bit, you run that, compiler collects information, and now the compiler compiles again, and it can be smarter because it has more information. So JIT compilation means alternate between running and compiling, and the big benefit is that you can collect runtime information and use it for better compilation. So, oh, one more thing. Um, you sort of know that JavaScript is just in time compilation because you cannot separate the JavaScript executable from the source code. Like, when you run JavaScript code, you always need the source code. It can be minified source code, but it needs to be JavaScript. If anybody has experience with C++, you have a very clear separation between runtime and compile time, because it's two separate steps. First you say GCC, dash, and so on, and you wait a little bit while it compiles, and you get an executable, and that is separate from the source code. So there, there's only one compilation, and it compiles everything, and it does not have the advantage of gathering information from the runtime, it does everything at once. But at JavaScript, we alternate, and we can separate the two processes. So this picture now of, of any basic compiler, for JavaScript engines, it looks different. Um, so the interpreter is a JIT compiler, and actually you have this feedback loop. It's not one directional all the way down, it's like, all the way down, and then back and forth between those two. Okay, so the, the fact that the compiler can gather some runtime information and create better code the next time that it compiles code, that gives us some speed up, but it's not quite the 100x that we actually need to run modern JavaScript. Um, what every compiler has up their sleeves is a so-called optimizing compiler. So every modern engine has at least two compilers. Um, JavaScript core even has three compilers. And what the optimizing compiler does, it, it recompiles so-called hot functions. Um, a function is hot if it's run many times. There, there are certain heuristics that distinguish between how often is the function run and what size in it, and it is it, and at some point the compiler considers it hot, and then the optimizing compiler jumps in and it does a little more work, like time-wise it's a little more expensive to compile with the optimizing compiler, but you get 
better machine code. So you spend a little bit more time recompiling a function that's run a lot, but then when you do run the function and when you run it a lot, you're saving time because now it's faster. So our picture gets even more complicated. So you start with your source code, parser parses it, generates an abstract syntax tree, and now we don't have one JIT compiler, we have two compilers, we have a baseline compiler, the one that handles all the cases, and it generates, well, sort of average machine code. And then we have the optimizing compiler that only handles special cases, those that are worth optimizing, and it generates machine code that is really fast when you run it. And since I work on V8, some name dropping here. So our baseline compiler is an interpreter and it's called Ignition. And our optimizing compiler is called Turbofan. So if you read any articles about Ignition and Turbofan and it's not in relation to cars, then it's probably about the compiler pipeline in V8. All right, so far the theory, so Here's a high-level graph of what the compiler looks like in, in the V8 JavaScript engine, and it's similar to the other engines. Um, so in, in Safari and JavaScript core, you would have a third compiler, the one that is handling super hot functions, and that actually works really well for them. JavaScript has some amazing performance things going on. Um, but also in, in Microsoft Edge and Firefox, you have at least these two compilers that help you to speed up JavaScript. But so that's the high-level overview, and now I want to, I hope to make it more concrete by giving you an actual example. And compilers are fairly complex, 45 minutes is not that long, so I'm sticking with a really, really simple example. So I have this function here that you would probably not write in real code because it's so simple, but it's my function called add, it takes one parameter object, and all it does is it returns one plus object.x. And to make it even simpler, we will just focus on the plus sign, on the addition operator for now. What is the plus sign doing? It adds numbers or it concatenates strings, right? Everybody has pluses somewhere in their code, I'm sure. Um, if we look at the JavaScript specification, though, the ECMAScript specification, don't worry about reading this. Um, don't, you don't need to care about the details. I only want to show you that this is actually a really long list. I mean, when you start out learning JavaScript, the addition operator is fairly early on. It might not even be explicitly said. But if you look at the specification, it's 10 steps that you have to follow to create correct JavaScript. And actually, it's much longer because every single one of these steps um, calls another method that in turn has like lots of steps itself again, like too primitive and get value and so on. So um, it's just lots of steps you have to go through to as a compiler when you want to plus two things together in JavaScript. Um, my teammate Ben actually went through the trouble of following along the, the JavaScript specification for the simple addition operator, and he drew out that diagram. So you can see, from a compiler's perspective, something as simple as a plus just to be spec compliant, which all the, the engines have to be, you have to follow all these steps. And, um, obviously, lots of steps means many instructions, means not very fast performance-wise. If you add numbers in a for loop, and every time you have to do all of this, you're going to be waiting a long time. Um, and I want to point out, I think that's pretty cute, at the top of the specification, there's a note. The addition operator either performs string concatenation or numeric addition. So the editors of the spec actually had the need to put in this note because if you just look at the steps, what it's doing, it's sort of hard to figure out what the plus is doing. So they like summarized it at the top. All right, so if you have anywhere in JavaScript some object plus some other object or some variable plus some other variable, we don't know that they're objects, 
Then from a compiler's point of view, it's lots of instructions. So uh, from a performance standpoint, that is not what we want. That is just a lot of work. But if you think about adding two integers from the point of view of a computer, that is basically what CPUs were built for. I mean, they're not binary numbers, but that is a really simple task for, for, for computers. And also in JavaScript, if you're just adding integers, it's not really that complicated specification-wise. You just have to make sure that you're in the case integer plus integer. Um, if you add doubles, yes, there's some funny rounding quirks, but really it's not as complicated as that specification. Or even string concatenation, that's fairly straightforward. So if a compiler could use the information that it's really just adding doubles and not doing anything according to the specification, that would be really good in, in terms of performance because it would be a lot less instructions. And that's actually exactly what we use in JavaScript engines. So back to our add function. The first time that we call this add function, the compiler has to really follow the whole specification for the addition operator. There's no way around it. If we do any shortcuts, then it would not be correct JavaScript. But now we're calling this function multiple times, and I said before, the, the big advantage of a JIT compiler is that it can collect information during runtime. So as we're running this function, that is during runtime, and we collect information. And the information that we're collecting here is, well, always adding integers, right? We ran this a bunch of time. We did 1 plus 7, 1 plus 42, 1 plus 13. An integer addition would be really easy. So the compiler now can pass off this function to the optimizing compiler with the information that it usually sees integers. And we can, or well, the optimizing compiler then generates machine code that is really fast if you only add integers. The machine code would do something completely wrong if all of a sudden you pass it a string or an object. But for integers, it gives you the right sum and it gives it to you really quickly. So after we optimize, when we now call this function again with an integer, yay, that is fast. Um, and you could not do that if you had ahead of time compilation. Because if you compiled this ahead of time, the compiler wouldn't know that it's usually integers, so it wouldn't be able to generate this fast code path for us. Do you see a problem with this, though? Nobody is stopping you from changing your mind and just calling this function really differently. So what's happening now? Well, actually, when we run this optimized machine code, we always do a quick check before to make sure our assumptions are right. We just say, um, hey, is this an integer? Awesome, let's go with the fast pass. And if it's not an integer, well, it's not the end of the world. We just go back to the baseline compiler. We follow the specification. Um, it's a little slower, but it's still correct. It's not crashing your pro program. Like, everything works. And usually, you wouldn't notice the slowdown. You only notice the slowdown if you write a framework or something really mathematical, and it's run a lot. Um, but it, it, it would add up all over your program, so you kind of want to avoid it. But um, nothing is breaking here. It's, it's still working. The only thing is we went back to the baseline compiler. So in our picture, when we first run the add functions the first few times, it's the baseline interpreter ignition that's handling that. We get machine code that is fairly slow. At some point, the baseline compiler signals to the optimizing compiler that we're running this add function many times. It's hot. It should be optimized. And now Turbofan generates better machine code and it can only do so because it uses this feedback information that we're adding integers. And if we ever change our mind or if there's different kind of data coming from the customer that turns into different objects, um, if we change our mind, then we violate the assumption that the parameter is an integer, so this feedback doesn't quite match anymore, and we'll just go back here to the slower bytecode. So just-in-time compilers, they use this speculative optimization. 
They run a few times, they collect information at runtime, and then they speculate what will happen. And then they use these speculations to make better and faster code. Okay, so this was about integers, and I think you can all see how this is different for strings and doubles and other kind of objects, um, or for objects, but Integers is only half the story. The, the way more common thing you have in any real JavaScript code is different kind of objects, right? You have big data structures, big objects, they all differ. Um, and it won't help you if you ha have a fast pass for integers because you usually use objects that carry more information. Um, so one thing that you always do in JavaScript is that you load properties from an object, right? And the compilers also have a trick for optimizing for that case here. So I want to look at this property lookup now. You have this all over your code, and intuitively you say, well, it's just getting a property of the object, but actually it's a lot more. Um, and you know that you could get a type error if you do that. You can you can get um, cannot get property X of undefined um, object that X might not be defined and be undefined. Object might not have an own property X, but you might find it on the prototype chain. So you have to recursively go up the prototype chain. The object might be defined as a proxy that has a get trap. So every time you get a property, your your function is being executed, which can have any kind of side effects that you put in there. And um, the X might have been defined ES6 style with an accessor descriptor. So you don't set a value, you set a get and a set function. So even for you as a developer, there's quite a few things that could happen if you just say object at X. It's not as simple as it might look because you use it everywhere. But for a compiler, it's even more complex because even if, as in the most common case, the object has a property X, the compiler needs to know where in the memory layout is the value for that X. Like in JavaScript, there's nothing that specifies what the properties of an object are where the compiler could just look up where that is. That is something we handle internally in the engine, and it's up to the engine implementers how they do that, and they just need to keep track of where they put the values, so when you do query object that X, you get the correct value. Um, and again, the, the specification is fairly complex. It's lots of steps. There's a recursion hidden in there. There's a arbitrary side effects from calling user functions and so on. But obviously, you are doing property lookups all the time. So that is something we have to speed up in the JavaScript engines. So let's look at how we do that. So we're calling our fancy add function again. And the very first time that we call it, we have to follow the steps from the JavaScript specification. Otherwise, it wouldn't be spec compliant, so quite a lot of work. So now that we've figured out um, where to get this 42 value when we call the add function with this particular object, we actually cache this information. So we have a cache, and what we put in the cache is for this shape of object, so in this case, an object that is an object literal with only one property X that is an integer, and we didn't mess with the prototype chain. For this shape of objects, um, we put in the shortcut of where to find the value. So in, in our memory layout, that is usually in the simplest case, just an offset to where the object is, where this value of X would then be. Um, so we store the shape and a shortcut of how to get to the value. This is very important. We are not storing the actual object, and we are not storing the value. Like, the, the result here is 42, but we don't put that in the cache. We only put a shortcut how to get to that X value. And we associate that cache with the call side of the property lookup. All right, so the next time that we call the function, when we are trying to get the object that X, Instead of looking up the ECMAScript specification, we first ask the cache. 
right? That's, that's a common thing that, you know, you, you have a cache, and so later when you want data, first thing is ask the cache, and only then make the expensive request. And that's exactly what the JavaScript engine does. It's asking the cache, and it's saying, hey, cache, do you have an entry for objects that look like this? And you can tell the second time I call it, it's a different object. It has a different value for x, but they look very similar, and they actually look the same internally to the compiler. And then the cache says, oh, yeah, I have an entry for that. Just go to this position in the memory, and you'll get your x value. So instead of doing these 10 steps, we have to do one quick lookup in the cache, and then just follow the shortcut. And these caches, they actually have their own name. They're called inline caches, because traditionally, they were actually inlined into the code. Um, and we abbreviate them with IC. So if you ever look at our source code, or if you do some tracing, um, you'll see lots of variables or classes that have the, the letters IC in them. So that stands for inline caches, which is exactly that cache in the code that gives you a shortcut for property lookups. And an inline cache is always associated with the call side. So in this piece of code here, even though it's one function and twice exactly the same lookup, there are two separate call sites. So the inline caches are completely independent for these two lines. Um, I kept waving my hand and saying shape of an object. So this is something internal to the engines. It's not specified in the specification. In V8, we call the shape of an object a map. So if two objects have the same map, then we know that they have the same memory layout, and we can treat them the same if you make the same queries on them. And sometimes people also refer to these shapes as hidden classes, because obviously they're not a class that you can query as a, as a developer on the JavaScript side, but conceptually they're similar to classes of objects in Java. If you have a set of objects, and if they do belong to the same class, then they have the same memory layout, and they are sort of treated the same way. So the, the inline cache is a cache of the map of an object. That means what's the shape of it. That gives you a shortcut of how to get to the result. And if you ever want to play around with this yourself, you can actually use these hidden intrinsic functions in V8 to get some information about these internal details. So we have a bunch of functions in V8. We call them intrinsics. You can call them in JavaScript code if you start V8 with certain flags. So if you start Chrome or Node.js with a special flag, allow native syntax, you have access to some functions that you prefix with a percentage sign, and they give you information about internal state, like they're useful for debugging and things like that. So there's a half same map where you can actually play around with to check your intuition about whether you understood what we mean by two objects having the same map. All right. So in our graph, when we call the add function, just as before for the property lookup, first ignition is handling that, the baseline compiler. If at some point the function is hot, then we pass it on to Turbofan. Turbofan optimizes it, and it uses the feedback um, about the hidden classes, so that this lookup object that X can be made really fast now. And again, just like before, when instead of an int, we, call, we used a string, if now instead of having that object that only has one property, if we, for example, use an object that has two properties, then those do not have the same map. They're considered very different, and we cannot use the same shortcut to get x, because this x might be somewhere else in memory now. Like, if you would just set, take offset one of this other object at the bottom here, you'd probably not end up with the value for x. So in that code, in that case, we de-optimize, and we go back to the somewhat slower baseline compiler. I want to tie this in a little bit to what Prathy was talking about yesterday morning. If you remember, she was talking about reasonable JavaScript, and she said how super helpful types are to make your code more readable. Um, and I just want to clear this up, because I talk about types and shapes of objects, which is sort of like the type of objects. Um, in tools like Flow or TypeScript, where you typify your parameters, you do that for, for humans. 
It makes the code more readable. It makes your IDE be magic and help you a ton. It makes it easier to catch bugs early, but it's all for the developer. And it helps you with correctness of your code. You notice if you switch the order of parameters or something because you can't even compile it then. And um, when you write TypeScript or Flow, you cannot just put that in the console of the browser and run it. You first have to transpile it to ECMAScript specific specification, correct JavaScript, and then you run it in your application, right? When you use TypeScript, you always have a transpilation step that gets rid of all the TypeScript annotations and you're ending up with regular JavaScript. Um, the, the shapes or maps in V8, they are not for the developer. They are internally for the compiler. So they don't help us or the JavaScript developer to avoid bugs or to make the code better readable. They're just there for the compiler. And they're not helping with correctness. Um, you can switch the shapes just as we saw before and your JavaScript is still executed correctly. They only help with performance. And also the shapes in V8, they're not determined ahead of time. They're determined at runtime. So just to put types and TypeScript versus types and shapes in V8 next to each other. This is how they're different. And unfortunately, just because something has the same type in TypeScript, it's not necessarily the same shape in V8. Um, but usually, if two things have the same shape from the point of view of the compiler, then they usually also have the same type, except for when you do like type definitions in TypeScript, and a string is either a first name or a last name, and for the compiler, they would both be the same kind of strings. Um, but so, so in general, if you use tools like TypeScript or Flow, which help you to stick with the same type of, of variables, you're definitely not working against a compiler, which is a good thing. OK, so I want to go into a little more detail about our baseline compiler, the bytecode interpreter that we call Ignition. Um, so that's the, the first step that our compiler is doing after the parser has created the abstract syntax tree. And we, V8 used to not have bytecode. The baseline compiler would straight out compile machine code. It was just not very optimal machine code. But earlier this year, we changed the compiler pipeline, and we have an interpreter now that generates bytecode. Um, and I mentioned earlier that the V8 team is in Munich, but the interpreter is actually mostly built in London. And the reason why it's not originally coming out from the V8 team, but by a different team, is that it was sort of motivated by, by Android, by mobile because a bytecode interpreter helps you to decrease the memory size. You only have to store a few bytecodes rather than all of the machine code. Um, so that was the original motivation at some point, and that's why we have another very small team that's not in Munich. Um, but actually, Ignition did not only help us with the memory size, it actually really helped us internally in structuring our code and making it fairly readable. And I want to show you some bytecode here. So these six lines are actually the bytecode for our add function. Um, before I go into explaining what they mean, our bytecode interpreter is a register machine, so it has these virtual registers, R0, R1, R2, and so on, where you can store things into and load them from. And it has one special register, the accumulator, that is always used in every bytecode or almost every bytecode. And the advantage is that you don't explicitly have to mention it. So your bytecodes are shorter because you don't always have to pass that, that operand around. So we have a bunch of registers where you can store things in and then do stuff with them. So the bytecode for our function the first thing it says is stack check. That's some housekeeping work we have to do every time we enter a function. Let's ignore that. But then it says load smy1. So smy is our word for small integer. 
that's just integers that are not too big so we don't have overflow issues. So that means load the integer one into the accumulator. We never say accumulator, but that is implicitly implied here. So our registers look like this now. The value one is in this accumulator register. So the next line, store R0 into the, uh, from the accumulator. So we take whatever is in the accumulator and store it into the register R0. Then the next line, load named property. So remember we had to do this property lookup object.x. That's a named property, the name is x. So a0, all the parameters in the byte called are called a, an object was our first parameter, so a0, and we're loading the, the property x, which is stored in a side table that x is the, the first entry, that's why it's zero. So, so we're loading the value of that in the accumulator. And when we call add with the object x42, that name property is just 42, right? Okay, and then the next one, add R0. So that means add the value that, it's in, that is in R0 to whatever is in the accumulator. So add these two together, which obviously is 43. And that's all the function had to do, right? Get a property, add them together. Um, we leave this result value in the accumulator so that the next function, the next bytecode can work off or can work with this 43 value now. So the bytecode at first, it might look a little bit confusing, but if you read it carefully and if you know that there's always this accumulator register, then I think this is actually fairly readable, like especially compared to assembly machine code. So that's what the ignition bytecode looks like and then a little bit of an explanation what it does. Okay. So I keep saying that on the left side of our diagram where we always have this baseline compiler, it is slow because it's not optimal machine code, it's many instructions. And on the right-hand side in the diagram that I showed you earlier where we had the optimizing compiler where the hot functions were passed to, I said this is optimized machine code. And I just want to give you an idea for this add function what the difference between the left and the right-hand side is. Um, I mean left and right-hand side of that diagram with uh, source code, parser, and then compiler, faster compiler, and so on. So on the left-hand side, this is the assembly code generated for our add function in the baseline compiler. And it actually runs on for like two or three more pages. Because these instructions, they have to reflect what I showed you earlier in the specification. This really long maze of following things and doing recursive calls and so on. So this is a lot of work for the compiler. It's all these steps just to call this tiny little add function. And on the right-hand side, this is actually the assembly instructions, so the, the raw machine code for the add function when the optimizing compiler is done with it. So if we've called this function always with the same shape of objects um, and we're always adding integers together, then you have four lines versus pages of instructions. Um, very quickly, if anybody is familiar with assembly code, or if you're not, this is what these instructions mean. So the first one, compare, we do a comparison, and here we are comparing the maps or the shape of the object. So by doing this comparison, we are checking whether we have the same object that we had all the time before, the, the one that we speculated that we will get and optimized for. So we're comparing these two values. If they're the same, we know, oh, they have the same map, the same shape of object. Um, if that comparison evaluates to false, then we do a, a jump to bailout. So that was the, the bailout, the de-optimization, where we had to go back with the red arrow to the baseline compiler. So that would actually bring us back to the left-hand side, and we'd have to do a few hundred instructions instead of four. But if those two are the same, 
Then the next thing we do is a move instruction. This is where we are moving the named property, which in this case we know is just at an offset to the object. That's the array x plus 1b. That's like the, the offset to the object that was the parameter, because we know that's where the value is, because we know what the shape of the object is. We just checked that. So we move that into a register, and then it's one more instruction. It's the actual integer addition of, of that plus one. So four versus lots of pages, especially if you do call this function multiple times, I think you can all see how this can give you this performance improvement and why we are not stuck with the JavaScript from 2001. So, to really drill that into you, the, the just-in-time compilers and JavaScript optimization, in JavaScript engines, they are heavily relying on speculative optimization. So we, we gather information at runtime, and that's why it's so important that we alternate all the time between run and compile time and then and not do one first and then the other. We gather information at runtime, and then we speculate that the future will look similar to what we've encountered before, and we optimize for that case. Um, V8 is open source, and so the other big engines, so you can try out all of this yourself. You can use um, Chrome or Node is probably easier because you use that on the command line anyways. You can also build V8 yourself, the instructions on the web, and then you have D8, that's the debugging shell for V8, and you just call that with different flags to get to some of the information that I talked about. So you can print opcode, that is print the optimized code, those four lines that I just showed you would be the result of that. You can print the bytecode, I showed you the bytecode. You can, for example, trace IC, so you trace the inline caches to see the different states that they're in. Um, and the last one, I like the last one, trace optimization and trace deoptimizations. When you run that, you see when is which function being optimized and when is it deoptimized? So you can totally follow through and see, oh, I ran this for a while and now it says optimized, and oh, here I changed the input so it had to deoptimize it. We bailed out and went back to the left side where it was the, the baseline compiler. So you can play around with all of that if you want to. Um, in the past, you might have seen specific performance advice for V8. Um, that is not really applicable anymore because we switched out the compiler pipeline completely this year. And so many things that our old pipeline was just not able to handle and the optimizing compiler got fixed now. So I don't have any specific advice for you. I, I can't give you a single piece of code and tell you on Monday when you're back at work, avoid this and you will see a speed up. We, we don't have anything like that anymore. Um, and if we do have, it's a bug and we're trying to fix it, but it's not like an inherent structural thing that we will never fix like it was in the old compiler pipeline. But the advice that I do want to give you is that because of how JavaScript engines work, because of the speculative optimizations, if you write code that basically looks like it's statically typed, then you're working with the engine and you allow the engine to use all its power to give you the best performance. So write code that's basically static typed in nature, statically typed in nature because that is what's best for modern JavaScript engines. Thank you. Can we have questions? Hey, first of all, great talk. Thanks. And uh, I have one question. Uh, you said the engine uh, caches object skeleton or shape of object, right? So does it mean when we do uh, delete a property, uh, like say delete object dot x, does it mean that uh, it decreases the performance? Yes, yeah, so the question is if we call delete on a property, how does that in affect performance? So every time you delete or add or even just define properties in a different order, they're different objects, they're, they're different maps for the compiler. Okay. So they cannot be treated the same and it might give you a little bit of speed down for performance. Um, 
yeah. So, so if, if it is feasible for your code, sometimes it's better to just set the value to undefined instead of deleting the property. That's something we can go to on Monday and apply to our code. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, sometimes we have to access the properties on an object multiple times. So is it uh, performant to cache that uh, property into a local variable? Or, and if it is performant, then how much it will increase the performance of a code? I'm not sure that I fully understood the question. So the caching is always done by the engine anyways. And um, the, the details of it, we might change a little bit when and how much it caches and when it goes into which state. Um, it's helpful if you can define all the properties when you first generate the object instead of to later add or delete properties. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, uh, I have a question, slightly off topic. But uh, you mentioned that uh, in case of Node.js, we can have not only V8, but the other engines as well. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't, uh, I don't, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. that works. Yeah. So I don't actively do backend development in Node.js. So I would just like to know, like, uh, in what scenarios would we need to swap out one engine for another, and whether it's a very complex thing or it's something fairly easy? Oh, uh, it's, it's very easy to get Node with Chakra Core, that's the Microsoft engine. You just go to the Node.js repository or the Node.js website and there's links for binaries of Node.js and you can also get all the source code and build it yourself. And Microsoft has great documentation there, how you get it, and they're super helpful if you do run into any problems. Um, so it's, it's not hard to get that. The spider node fork is still a, a project um, that's currently being developed. I don't think you can fully use it yet. Um, and you might want to use a different engine to compare performance or maybe if you have specific things that you need from, from the debugger. Maybe you don't want to use the, the V8 inspector, but you do want to use Microsoft Chakra debugging protocol. Um, yeah, those, those are reasons for why you would want to switch to the other engine. Okay, thank you. Hello. Uh, okay, thank you. It was a very great talk. Uh, so my question is, uh, right, um, since we are using like a JIT and uh, speculative uh, optimization, and uh, so instead of a spec uh, a speculative optimization, aren't we going to machine learning for the compiler, as Google is a lot into the machine learning? Sorry, can you say the last part again? Uh, machine learning for compiler. Right now we are, like as you told, that uh, we are going for a speculative uh, optimization. Uh, for optimization, we are using a speculative optimization, right? Yes. So, and as Google is already into machine learning, aren't we going to use that machine learning for optimization? Isn't it clear? M maybe you should catch me after and, and we discuss it offline. I think I'm not fully getting what you're asking. You want to find me afterwards? Sure. Okay, Thank thanks. You. Could human uh, type system like Flow or TypeScript in the future give V8 or other JavaScript engines hints on how to optimize the code and which shapes to expect? That, that's a good question. Um, right now, they don't, but it's definitely an interesting point of research because especially for frameworks, um, that would be really great if, if the engine could benefit from that information that the human developer has specified up front. But at the moment, we don't have that yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, talking about WebAssembly, uh, uh, I know that WebAssembly and uh, these bytecodes are kind of different. Is there any effort to uh, combine them so that uh, the code generated by WebAssembly, the bytecode generated by WebAssembly could like take advantage so that you don't have to throw out chunks of data over the bridge? Is oh, the, WebAssembly is using the same compiler pipeline. So is, it in the same, is it in the same like namespace and same uh, context? It's, it's using uh, TurboFan, yeah. 
So it's related to like kind of Node.js. Node.js um, like, uh, uses uh, singletons, right? Uh, like we have these modules which we can like load once and then that stays in memory. So is there anything that V8 does with respect to that? I load a module mm -hmm. um, and then I try to use that module again and again. So that module will be like, uh, like do this like uh, compile ever like for multiple uses though like I hope. Uh, when are node modules compiled? V8 uses the same optimizations for the modules and just node core puts in the machinery so that the loading works but they should also be com compiled and optimized. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Francisca. It was an amazing talk. Thanks.